My name is Johan Groenewald. I was uh, merely the interloper organizing uh, and inviting you. First of all, I wish to introduce the acting director of STIAS, Bernard Latagan, and he will welcome all of you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. I seem to be welcoming you all the time, but uh, it uh, is a, a, all the more pleasure because we have every time new visitors uh, joining us, and we have the ambassador of Sweden this morning with his wife, that we are very honored and privileged that you are with us. And uh, we hope that you will also contribute to what we are trying to do here. Uh, we, have, uh, we are at the end of a very interesting, and I would, I would say exciting, uh, experience of this uh, week. And as I explained, the intention of STIAS is to create these spaces where we can look intensely based on the latest information and talk about openly about um, the challenges that we face in this part of the world, but also in our continent and worldwide. And we are very privileged to have expert uh, inputs from our colleagues from all over the world to address this very important uh, issue. So this morning is, in a certain sense, uh, the high point uh, to come to some form of conclusion. And uh, I'm very happy to welcome you here, and I hand over to Maud Olsson. Well, thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, my name is Maud Olsson. Uh, I'm uh, appointed by the Wallenberg Foundation, who is the, the, the founder of STIAS, uh, to uh, lead the activity called Roundtable. And it came up as an idea uh, some years ago that this place should be a place where we could discuss important themes that are relevant uh, and we can create also an environment where people from different backgrounds, from different countries, but also with uh, different objectives can come here and discuss important themes. Uh, the let me say also that I'm a former uh, mi Minister of Energy and Enterprise from Sweden, uh, former Deputy Prime Minister. So I've been working as this also with a lot of contacts with South Africa. Uh, we have a bilateral cooperation between South Africa and, and Sweden. And as a Deputy Prime Minister, I was responsible for that. And one theme of this bilateral was also the energy policy. Well, when we came up with the, th the first theme of this roundtable, because this is the first roundtable that we have arranged here at STIAS, uh, we said that energy must be one of, of the most important theme to discuss today. As a minister, I know, know that globally we discuss it all the time. We discuss the financial crisis, of course, the job crisis, uh, the climate crisis, but the energy crisis is also one of the biggest themes globally. So we thought that that would be a, a good thing to do. And when we talked to our South African colleagues here, uh, we also found out that there is a, a very um, important discussion here in South Africa about the integrated resource plan, which was uh, decided in 2010. But we have to look at this plan and see if, if it's um, sufficient right now, or if we have to, to look at it and see could there be changes around in the world that n uh, is important for the coming resource plan? Should we change a little bit? Should we do something else? Or, or, or what shall we do? So we invited for three days a lot of researchers from different countries, uh, business men and women, uh, politicians. Uh, and we have been sitting here in in a room with no windows uh, the whole day is <laughs> discussing this issue. And we, we're going to come back to, to that. Uh, and yesterday we had a so-called the round table, where, where we have invited even more people to, to discuss it. Uh, and I must say that it has been very interesting to, to listen to all this, because I've, I feel that it has been very open, uh, a very open discussion where we have tried our arguments, where, where we have tried uh, the facts, uh, and also where we have tried to see uh, how can a combination of different sources and different policies and all that, can, how can that become a good resource plan for the future? Uh, 
we have um, seen that there are, are uh, key things that are needed here. And um, I have some colleagues here around me uh, that's going to present the details of the conclusions for, from these four days. Uh, here we have Thomas Kåberger. Uh, he is a professor from the Chalmers University in Sweden, uh, but he is also advisor to the Japanese government right now in energy matters. I have uh, Salim Fakir, uh, who is, I don't know the, the title, but uh, <laughs> WWF. Uh, Worldwide Fund for Nature. Yeah, 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 but the title <laughs> of you. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ah, Salim Fakir is, yeah, yeah. Well, and here you have Andreas Kahlgren. Uh, he is a former minister of environment. Uh, and he was here yesterday talking about the climate issue uh, connected to the energy issue. Uh, and we have Vikas uh, van Nieker, And I have to read this. Uh, he's the director of the Center for Renewable and Sus Sustainable Energy Studies. Is correct? Yeah. Uh, so you also see. Cold crisis. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cold crisis. And together with us, uh, Anton Eberhard, uh, the professor uh, at the Graduate School of Business, or the Graduate Business School yeah. Yeah, in Cape Town, uh, but also commissioner of the National Planning Commission. Uh, he has also been instrumental uh, in this discussion. So here you see sort of a core group. Uh, together with that, we have also had Thomas B. Johansson from, from Sweden, who is... Um, Oh, then you know the title of him too. He's a former director of the International Institute for Industrial and Environmental Economics at uh, Lund University. Yeah. You understand why I, I don't <laughs> no. make it correct. Uh, but th that has been the core group together with Johan uh, and, and uh, making this happen. So uh, we're going to present uh, the results from this and, and we're going to do it like this. We, we make short introductions here and then we open uh, for comments questions and other things from you because we want to continue this dialogue. This is, this is just observations and, and things that we have seen and discussed these days. But we hope that the result from this will uh, open up a more continuous discussion about future energy policy here in, in South Africa. And uh, that's, that's our um, target for, for this discussion. And, and we are, of course, prepared to, to be in, in good health for doing so. Uh, but uh, now we're going to present the, the result. And first I hand over to Thomas Kåberger, who will talk about trends, what, uh, what we have seen, uh, what kind of trends we have seen during these days and globally. One of the most important trends globally is that the um, industrialization of renewable energy technologies have been rapid and that has led to decreased costs of in particular solar PV systems but also wind power systems and uh, it's a relevant observation that since the South African integrated resource plan was made these costs have been reduced to approximately half of what they were then and hearing about the uh, significant resources in also particularly in solar but also in wind that are available in South Africa, that opens new economic opportunities for, for South Africa that were not uh, considered at the, the, the relevant scale when the resource plan was made. Uh, well, I don't know how much more I should say now, but, but there are also significant opportunities we, we see in uh, independent smaller scale power production in, in South African industry and, and uh, other distributed sources that could in a relative short time frame help to reduce the strain on the, the South African power system, something that we could not see could be feasibly done with the large scale uh, power plants that were uh, considered previously in the plan. Yeah. And uh, we have also looked at the nuclear. Well, nuclear is a typical example of, of the large-scale technologies that have very long lead times and where the global experience in the last decade is that costs have become higher rather than lower. So, so this is a typical example of where the global trends show that there are other alternatives that have become more competitive whilst the, the global interest in, in, in nuclear has decreased. Yeah. 
And um, well, then we've also seen that there is um, a research which we haven't mentioned too much, and that is energy efficiency. What about that? Energy efficiency potentials are always difficult to assess because once you have identified the profitable potential, you tend to immediately do away with the inefficient, uh, less intelligent uh, uh, processes that are, are in operation. Uh, but uh, I did report during the meeting of uh, a successful project that was carried out in Sweden a few years ago with the energy intensive industry, where it turned out that the Swedish mining industry had very large potential for very profitable investments improving energy efficiency. And uh, we tried to, to, to understand from the, the, the discussions here what, what the potential could be in the South African uh, uh, mining sector. And, and we believe there are, there are potential, but that, once again, this is something where as soon as you get into the details, it will be possible to say something quantitatively. But, uh, these opportunities should be explored because they may be very profitable investments and they would also improve the competitiveness of these industries when you manage to carry out the, the efficient investments. Mm. So you have reduced costs for the renewables, higher cost for nuclear, uh, somewhat coal. Uh, you can see energy efficiency as a resource, uh, but then you have uh, hydropower and gas yeah, if you look at the global uh, market, uh, gas has gone through a rather dramatic change as well, in particular in North America, where new technologies to extract uh, gas from, from shale has made uh, the, the resource base much larger. Uh, so uh, at the same time, gas-fired power production is something that can be uh, achieved with uh, off-the-shelf standard uh, power plants at a moderate scale and, and reasonably time to short time horizons. But uh, then to what extent that could be uh, an option for South Africa? Uh, well, imported gas might be something that can be achieved in a reasonably modern, medium time scale, but uh, shale extraction will have long lead times as well. Mm. Any other that have comments on the, the trends internationally? What I thought, um, <coughs> what I've, uh, I think the, the important, um, uh, pre you know, the presentation that Thomas did, uh, given his work in Japan and your assessment of uh, trends in Europe and so on, uh, it was very important to illustrate the extent to which there's been a rapid decline in cost in, in renewables, particularly PV and wind. And wind, in many respects, is very. Uh, there was a person from Eskom here. Uh, uh, who was from the systems operator, who was basically arguing that uh, Eskom's um, generation cost is around 63, maybe 65 cents. Uh, and if you were at, at the carbon tax to it, which is coming through in, uh, in January 2015, <coughs> the cost of wind and coal is very close. Mm -hmm. uh, so more competitive uh, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of grid parity. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you wanted to add. Now, I, I could add that this kind of discussion on, on what are the, the sure. existing marginal cost of production are always very difficult in, in a situation like the South African with a, a monopoly <coughs> company controlling the, the production facilities. And when we came to the discussion on how to achieve investments uh, in, in, in power generation outside of, of ESCOM, the, the establishment of, of a guaranteed access to the market and some sort of transparent, predictable price setting mechanism. Prices may not necessarily sure. be predicted, but the price setting mechanism that, that guarantees fair conditions for new entrants is immensely important. Yeah. Because? Yeah, I, I think the other, the other factor that was also discussed here is if you build these very big, large um, power plants, they tend to be over budget and, and there'll be long delays. And we're having exactly that today with the two large coal power plants that we are building. And therefore, they, there is a lot to be said to rather go for smaller, more modular power plants that with shorter lead times that you can, that, that you can, that you can put in. And then also, you know, if, if you need to adjust your plan, you are not locked into this large capacity that's going forward. And that's typically what we see in the rest of the world, is that very few people are now focusing on large plants. It's much more medium-sized plants and also more, more, more spread out. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I think what Vic is saying is very important, and uh, the the changes in technology and our ability to manage uh, electricity systems is uh, providing. Uh, I think it's, it's telling us that we need to have a very different vision for how we do energy planning in South Africa. So you can't do like the old way, where it's a little bit like the Russian model, where you try to predict the future and then you decide. Uh, you know, you must build coal plants, nuclear. Uh, these are large infrastructure investments. And I don't think it's very, uh, we won't be very efficient in predicting what the future would be. But we can be better in terms of designing uh, electricity or energy systems that allows us to adapt more, uh, more flexibly uh, to a changing demand for, for energy and changes in the economy, the growth of the economy. Mm -hmm. And also accommodate new technological changes uh, that are happening on scale now that we can't uh, uh, envisage before. So I think these, these things are making uh, the planning of the future in terms of energy planning an uncertain horizon, which means that we've got to think institutionally and uh, in terms of our, our planning approach, we have to think very differently of how we do that. And so I think the importance of market mechanisms, uh, different pricing mechanisms. So if I may be a bit controversial because I'm South African, <laughs> uh, we are stuck in an old mode of planning that is completely unfeasible or uh, inappropriate for where the future is going. And we have to really change that. I think that's the main message f uh, from our side. And, and I, c I could say that it's not only a matter of where the future is going. If you look at the development in Europe last year, the largest new source of electricity generating capacity was solar PVs. The second largest was wind power. In the US, wind power made up almost half of the new installed capacity last year. And in China, wind power now contribute more electricity than nuclear. And the increase in, in wind power capacity last year was uh, slightly larger than the total installed nuclear capacity. And so this is yeah. already happening. And I think that was kind of sort of new information. I think uh, uh, if you look at the figures and, and see the scale of the renewables, I think that was quite a new uh, information and that these are growing very, very fast. And, and of course, the prices are also going down. We also had an interesting discussion about financing. Yeah. Uh, maybe you, one should say a few words about that. So, uh, because you understand, or should I just? I, 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 we're going to, but I just want to report from from the discussion because I think when the finance uh, guy here he said that well, it's a problem to finance nuclear today, because nobody in the private sector will take want to take the risks, and that's also the same with coal. Uh, so. If we just rely on private investments, or if we want them to, to invest, uh, it's going to be a, a problem. And, and for that, if you want to invest in, in such energy sources, you need uh, state money to, to do so. So uh, that was also you want important. To yeah, I, I think what came out in the discussion was that there were certain power stations that will be extremely difficult to finance going forward, um, coal and then especially nuclear. And the only way that one will be able to do it is if the state plays a very, very important role, which locks in you know, a lot of financial commitment going forward for many decades, not, not for years, but, but for many decades. While at the same time, and this renewable energy independent power producer procurement program showed you know, that there is a lot of private capital that is very willing to step into this market and, and finance it. And, and uh, there is basically no public money going into the renewable energy um, power plants which are currently being constructed in South Africa. And there is a big untapped market as well on, um, on, on, on um, pension plans which haven't entered into, into this space yet, but for an for a, for a investment of a pension fund, a power plant is a very attractive investment because it's a long-term investment with a guaranteed input or a guaranteed return from the, from, from the power plant. Um, and, and in the current in renewable energy power plants, we, they haven't even started to going into that, which is a significant fund in, in South Africa. 
um, that could be available for this kind of financing. Yeah. But um, you, you um, need to qualify that statement because you said step into this market. Yeah. Uh, and in the South African setting today, this is not really a market where yeah. anyone would like to step in because you don't have the regulatory framework where you're guaranteed access to market and where the price setting is, is transparent and predictable enough. So I think this is one of the challenges here to, to, to re-regulate the market in such a way that it will be become attractive for private investors to get into the electricity generation in South Africa, thereby also uh, offloading this responsibility from the, the government budget because there are other ways of using government funds that may be more important in the longer term and if the electricity and power market can be re-regulated so as to attract private capital that will be an advantage for the overall economic development in, in, in the country. Maybe one sure. could just uh, add also to the broader picture that we have discussed that uh, I mean if you look at the really two biggest consumers uh, of energy today in the world economies, United States and China, therefore also the biggest emitters if you look at the climate perspective that we were covering. Uh, you can see a, a um, trend here too where there is a great there are great expectations in the United States to become uh, independent of oil in something like 10 or 20 years depending on how fast they can move from uh, I mean imported oil <laughs> how fast they can move uh, into shale gas on one hand on the other hand also uh, non-conventional oil resources that they are exploiting it or rather expect to exploit within the United States on, on the other hand if you compare that with China that will as it seems due to the Chinese projections exhaust the oil market within some years and also create a similar pattern for the coal uh, demand I think uh, looking at those two economies and then looking at South Africa, it, th this picture becomes even more um, interesting and, and to me uh, both uh, uh, a bit, uh, um, it's new and it's also exciting because it really shows that South Africa has an enormous potential for creating both a more independence, which I think with this background will be very useful and also to create uh, or, and uh, exploit new resources that were I think underestimated or, or in any case not seen as being having so big potential some years ago so I think this really creates new perspectives also for already the high ambitions that South Africa ha has had in the climate change negotiations and where I think uh, South Africa has always played a very distinguished and, and, and very constructive role. This will, th the current possibilities on the, fl on the ground will really support those ambitions. That is my impression. Well, I said that we would discuss... I just, I just wanted to add yeah? one thing. The, uh, the one thing that occurred to me when we were having these three days of discussions, uh, and I think it's become more crystallized, is that uh, in South Africa we have a psyche of um, a big, large uh, infrastructure investments for power plants, uh, and that is usually uh, you know, uh, run by the state and, and maybe with some private. But the one area that uh, I think there's going to be huge opportunity, not only in South Africa, but the rest of Africa, is the micro renewables uh, movement uh, because the technology is becoming much more cheaper and so the the opportunity for aut autonomous power for individuals to be able to uh, finance their own um, private uh, 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 generation and I think the one thing that we have to we have to find ways to open that up a little bit more and that will also change the landscape for uh, how much the state needs to do uh, and large IPPs, but also individuals at household level. They can put up PV or even micro wind uh, generation capacity. And we are seeing increasing uh, use of PV. For instance, there were uh, in the conversations we had, uh, there are lots of companies, I know of at least two or three companies, that are using their rooftops, which is this uh, free space uh, to put PV, uh, uh, PV technologies on the roof and generate for their own use. And I think that's a very important trend. And the reason for that is that there's a big difference between what ESCOMs cost up in terms of generating electricity and what you get 
when you pay uh, to a municipality. And if you were to take PV and uh, uh, other uh, renewables, they are very close to what is called residential parity. It means that the prices that they can uh, uh, generate electricity at uh, using their own power is very close to what they can pay for a municipality. And I think most people would prefer to have their own power than rely on a system that might go off one day or might break down. Uh, because we're experiencing in this country uh, power shortages. And just to note that our reserve margin in South Africa is very low at the moment. Uh, we are in a, I know Doug Cooney keeps on reminding me that we are in an energy crisis at the moment. So. Yeah. Well, if we go over to the, the, uh, the power plan that we have, uh, the resource plan that we have, what are the main sort of problems with, with the resource plan? What, what have we seen? Sure. So from the, the discussions, it was very evident that um, in the old plan, we were planning for 80,000 megawatts uh, of installed capacity. And uh, if we said that we had a drop in consumption, because as electricity prices go up, people become more uh, conscious of their consumption. And that, might, that is starting to have an effect on the level of demand. But also the economic growth has slowed down. So if we said in another uh, 20 years what the demand would be, it's evident that we don't probably need 80,000 megawatts. We probably need around 60, maybe 65,000 megawatts. But uh, these are assumptions. Uh, but what it tells us is that we shouldn't be building uh, big power plants unnecessarily. Uh, we might be oh, spending money into an asset that is a stranded asset and may lock us into long-term payments uh, that the taxpayer will have to pay. And nuclear is one good example of that. If you were to build nuclear and you didn't need so much power, it would be a complete waste of resources. So I think this has been an important re revelation. Uh, the fact that we can build uh, uh, large power plants with a smaller uh, 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 with wind and, and more flexible technologies means that we must uh, try to design uh, an energy system in which we can adapt uh, as the demand grows and maybe have some fixed investments but not overdo it that we uh, put the country to financial risk and other risk. So gas, uh, uh, importance of gas and, and the growth in the in uh, the, the, the drop in the prices of, uh, of renewables has been a very important uh, element of that. The second part is that it's clear that energy efficiency is something that uh, uh, has had little bit of focus in the old plan. I think in the, if we were to do a new plan, I think that is something we need to really look at uh, very more, more closely and figure out how we can do that. Now, the number of ways in which energy efficiency goals can be reached you can do it uh, in currently by firms using uh, their energy more efficiently. They can uh, save cost and they can also produce more goods with the same amount of energy they've used. Uh, consumers will have to be much more uh, 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 conscious. But we can, in, uh, in terms of macroeconomic uh, uh, ways, we must move from uh, high energy intensive industries to new types of uh, uh, sectors where we can get more value for the use of energy, and that's a long-term thing. Yeah. We have to build our new human capital, we have to uh, try to look at the creation of uh, new types of sectors, maybe uh, you know, uh, uh, types of uh, uh, economic activity that, uh, that is high value but use less energy, like other countries are, are doing. So I think that's been uh, the important point. The one thing about nuclear that struck me uh, uh, that I didn't uh, really, and I think you mentioned it, uh, Thomas, is that uh, often people talk about the generation cost of a plant, but don't take into account the cost associated with waste and decommissioning. And often that is much larger than the actual uh, uh, cost for putting up a power plant in the first place. And I, I think if we took those three things, the installed capacity where the history is of uh, cost overruns, uh, quite high, can see that with Finland, uh, the waste management and uh, decommissioning of plants. You put all of that cost together, then it, uh, you know the evidence is quite clear that nuclear is a, is a, you have to do it if you really need to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're saying is that 
in our current, uh, on the basis of new evidence of the fact of cost reductions in renewable and availability of gas, uh, it, uh, the evidence is clear that the, the, the need for nuclear needs to be revisited. So that's a current plan. Just an additional comment on that as well. I mean, the, the, the other aspect that was also discussed is, you know, the <coughs> liability is where does the liability eventually sit? Does it sit, if you get at somebody to come and build a nuclear power plant and own and operate it, will they also take on the, the wider liability that such an investment might have if something happens in, in, in the future? And what is happening now in the UK, for instance, is that all the companies where this is put on the table, they say, but will you also take on the liability? They all walk away from, from these nuclear investments because in the end, it can only be the government, which means in the end it's only us who must then bear the final cost of a nuclear plant all the way until you know, we have recovered everything that was, that was put in place there. And, and I think that, and it's a long-term liability that we will take on for this country. So you know, it's not something that will happen in the next 40 years, it's some 50 years or, or beyond, which we are locking into the, the future taxpayers of this country. Yeah. And then we have been discussing some reforms, some political and institutional reforms. You were in, it, in, in this, but, but because, uh, what are the main reforms that have been discussed here? Um, the, the, you know, the, to, to open up the market was, was quite, a, quite a clear message a, a about it and also some very clear vision for the country and, and where, we, where we should go. And, and one of the issues was that, you know, who is responsible for what? What is the role of ESCOM? What is the uh, role for ITPs going forward? Um, there was this whole question of where, where does this power planning happen? And it was quite interesting, um, you know, when the people of ESCOM came and said, oh, the Department of Energy comes to us, and we do the power planning for the country, which is, you know, it should be the other, other way around, because the government actually controls and regulates ESCOM, but ESCOM actually does the planning and the modeling for the, the organization that regulates them. Now, you know, clearly there's a, there's a big conflict here that, that need to, needs to be resolved. Um, you know, the, the, the debate and the current legislation in Parliament about an independent systems and market operator where the whole, you know, acquisition of power or purchasing of power, but also control of the national grid and access to the national grid is basically taken out of ESCOM and putting in an independent state-owned organization which then, you know, is unbiased in how it allows other people to come in and, and feed into the grid. So the whole ISMO bill in front of, of Parliament is, is quite important mm -hmm. and the independence of, of, of such a, and, and the transparency of that is, is also quite important. Um, Many times, you know, we have plans in place in South Africa and certain deadlines that need to be met and we, we frequently go over them. For instance, the, the, the IRP, the, the um, Integrated Resource Plan, you know, it has to be updated every two years. It's the IRP 2010, so you know, it's 2013, so there's a problem here. There's a problem because there's an energy, uh, integrated energy plan that's now being um, debated which will feed into the new IRP but again you know that if we have an IRP and it's supposed to be updated every two years why don't we update it every, every two years so so we should look at that Th this whole issue of gas is a bit of an unknown in South Africa as well because and, and I just want to make this comment about gas as well in that you know, gas doesn't come without risk there's, there's risk in, in gas involved as well firstly you know you get locked into a feedstock that might be priced in dollars and not in rands I mean, we're used to our, our, our petrol price going up every month, but will we get used to our electricity price going up every month? So, so th there are some risks there. It can be mitigated by maybe shale or a deal with Mozambique so that you can you know, lock in a long-term contract. But, but that, that, is, that, that, that is one issue with that. So because, of, and, and also you need some basic infrastructure. You either need an LNG um, um, receiving port somewhere or you need a pipeline. Now, in order to do that, on the policy side, we need a gas strategy. So there should be a national gas strategy that should look at that. And that is something which the National Planning Commission have now asked the Department of Energy and they're working with them to, to, to develop that. Um, so that's, that's very important. And, and then of course, um, again, you know, we had a, an energy efficiency strategy that's there, but it just seems you know, that we are not implementing the, the national, in the, I mean, I've been involved with Sanary and the National Energy Association for, I mean, five years, and 
and, and although we talk a lot, you know, we don't do a lot. So I think that on, on energy efficiency, there should be some, some real action from the government to implement, to drive it down. Yeah. Uh, just to pick up on the gas thing, I think there, there were three things that I, I took out of the meeting. We had some very excellent presentations from three people on gas. And uh, even I, uh, I mean, as WWF, we don't support shale gas. But what struck me uh, as uh, very interesting is that uh, there is availability of gas, but to build the infrastructure uh, is going to be capital intensive. Um, so you could get it by ship, uh, which is called liquefied natural gas, and then you still have to maybe build a, a little port to allow the ships to dock. And then you need a pipeline to maybe a, a, a gas-fired power station. But for gas to work, we have to take a decision uh, of the number of gas-fired power stations that we want to make investments in. Because that would be key to, to allowing for broader use of gas in the market. If we don't have uh, a strong anchor, uh, a buyer of large quantities of gas, you can't justify the infrastructure investment. And I think that's the, the reason why we need to have a gas strategy so we can work out, do we import from Mozambique? They are, and in Mozambique, there's lots of new finds of between 30 to 150 TCFs. But the infrastructure to bring it to where it's needed is still needed, needing to be developed. And shale gas, I think the message was clear, it's still a long way, 12, 15 years. And lots of things can change in that 12, 15 years. Renewables prices can come down. There might be something new. Maybe fuels felt, fuel cells become better. Maybe Europe, Europe will solve the fusion problem. I know you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Not in 10 years. Not in 10 years, <laughs> okay. But the, I think the, these are important uh, nuances because people get excited. Oh, gas, you know, it's going to be cheap, but it's more complicated. Than yeah. Well, last but not least, uh, how <laughs> this, does this connect all the discussion to the climate policy? Uh, well, I think um, to, to summarize that is, first of all, that there is a new um, possibility really created through the reduced costs of wind and solar. I think that was one part that struck me the most as I listened to those different presentations and also listened to the conclusions. Um, and that uh, also uh, of course, uh, is related to the great potentials. I mean, I was struck also by the facts that were presented of uh, the potentials for especially solar uh, energy and electricity here in South Africa, which is higher than most of the comparable places. Uh, that, that was uh, impressive and, and uh, promising from, from, from my point of view. Uh, secondly, it seems now that this would create really great possibilities also of uh, economic opportunities and thereby, as a result of economic opportunities, South Africa would also fulfill uh, what uh, South Africa has already agreed to internationally on climate uh, emission reduction. So it's rather an, a change logic here. New possibilities for solar and for, for wind creates reduced costs, good for economy, but that will also, as a consequence, lead to uh, fulfilled uh, uh, climate change uh, reduction, em emission reductions. And <clears throat> finally, I think two, two things to mention in an international context, I mean, I was struck by the capacity and the possibilities, the potential for, for South Africa to really uh, become also a player here that is not so dependent on difficulties on the, on the global market and in the global scene. I think that is, that is promising for South Africa. And, and lastly, with the Swedish eye, I think it, it will be important really also to create the right um, conditions for investments and for a developing market. I think for, seen with, with Swedish eyes here and to what we are uh, used to, I think that seems to be a reasonable discussion. Well, thank you very much. Th this was a sort of a report from the discussions and you hear that we are reflecting a lot around this and there are so many more we could tell you, but this is the short version. <laughs>